We just finished up a, I think it was the longest series that we've ever done here at Exalt. Normally, if we, we don't do a lot of series. We may do a couple a year, but whenever we do series, they're usually four, maybe five weeks. We did a nine-week-long series on the fruit of the Spirit, right? We started it back in August. And the reason we did that was because in the time that we are in right now, there is so much polarization between the right and the left and the Democrats and the Republicans and this media source and news outlet and this media source and news outlet. And listen, I know what I believe. I know who I am voting for, amen? I'm voting. Listen, there's the, uh, the, the, the story in Joshua when the angel comes to him and he says, are you on our side or on their side? And he says, neither. I'm on God's side. <laughs> said, you better get on my side, man. This isn't how it works. I'm on the side of God. I'm on the side of life, amen? There are babies that are created in the image of God, and it isn't my right or anybody's right to destroy that body that God put into that womb and created, and it says he's fearfully, wonderfully knitting that baby together in the darkness of its mother's womb, right? I stand on the side of life. I know where I stand on these issues, and I speak boldly about it. However, the Lord spoke to me that we should spend some time focusing on his spirit and his presence. And that's what we did. For nine weeks, we tried to uh, see what the word tells us. Because if we have the guy in the White House that we want, and if you want a little hint, I did say the guy in the White House that we want, then, and he's in there, and the economy is going good, and house prices are going good, but people are still dying and going to hell because you're not living with the spirit of God in you, amen? Then whoopee ding if we have a good economy. We need to have the spirit of Christ infiltrate our society. We must walk as children of God, as ambassadors for Christ, as we saw over the last nine weeks. But I do want now, now, okay, I want to, I feel the Lord leading me to talk about the spirit of confusion and the spirit of Christ. Because in our culture, there's a spirit of confusion, amen? There's a lot of information swirling around from a lot of different sources, a lot of different opinions and positions, right? There's a lot of people who are confused, about where they stand on certain issues. I see it on Facebook. People say, well, I don't know about the whole marijuana thing. Is it really that bad? I don't know about abortion. I mean, it is the woman's body, you know, and I'm not so sure. Did you know that they have between 2 and 5% of the population right now? This is October's poll said that about 2 to 5% are undecided between our presidential candidates. I'm not getting into who's right and who's wrong, but how in the world can you be undecided with these two polarizing figures, right? No matter whose side you're on, they couldn't be more opposite from each other, right? How people are undecided, but you do, you have people who are undecided, they're confused about what do I really believe? Where do I really stand on this issue or that issue? I mean, if you've read any of the amendments, there's six amendments on Florida's ballot this year. If you read some of the amendments, you almost feel like you have to have a lawyer to understand what they're saying, right? I mean, they, they intend, it almost seems like they did it on purpose, like they're trying to confuse you. They're trying to work wording in there that can be intimidating, right? And you see all these big words, and it can almost feel like that was done intentionally. And then people go to their kind of trusted news source, whatever that is, Fox, CNN, whatever, you're, 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 you know, the blaze or whatever it is, and you're trying to hope that the media or the person you're talking to or listening to can kind of help you clarify and tell you what you ought to believe, right? You're just hoping for some answers. And so there's this confusion that swirls around. You got facts and truth that get manipulated by different pundits and people who are telling you things that kind of go along with their side of the, the, the situation and what they think about that. And you got more and more voices because we've got social media. So you've got more and more people talking, right? More and more people promoting and telling you what they believe and what they think you ought to do and how you ought to vote. But with more people talking, it's getting more confusing. There's a story in the Bible in Genesis 11, if you want to turn there, where a lot of people were talking, but nobody was understanding each other. 
In this story, it's about the Tower of Babel, and it talks about that all of the people on the face of the earth, they were united, which is kind of cool. I mean, the Bible says in Psalm 133 is that when everyone's dwelling together in unity, that God commands his blessing there. But this was a different kind of united because the people of earth were all united speaking one voice, but it was in a, a sort of defiance to God. Because instead of relying on the Lord, seeking the Lord in, in one unified voice or in, in one accord, they were all coming together. They said, let us make a name for ourselves. Let us build a tower that reaches up to the heavens and make a name for ourselves. And God, it says, saw this. And he says, you know, all these people are unified right now. He says, they're all unified. And if they continue at this pace, there's not much that's going to stop them. Now that may sound like God was intimidated. I can assure you God was not intimidated, okay? God actually looked at it and he said, they're gonna destroy themselves. He says, if they remain unified because there is power in unity, amen? God says, if they remain this unified, he says, they're, they're gonna do some stupid stuff. They're gonna, they're gonna end up destroying themselves or I'm going to have to destroy them. So God, in his mercy, it says, confused their language. Go to, you're in Genesis 11. Go to verse seven really quick. God says, come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not, uh, so, so where is that, where'd I go? So they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off the building of the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. This was actually an act of mercy, because God knew that if everybody is working together, but they're doing it in a way that is not glorifying to God, they're not seeking God, they're seeking their own self-promotion, it would end very badly for them, amen? So God in his mercy confused, that word babble, it's, it, it's a Hebrew word, it's, it's, it's also bilal, and it means confuse. So the word babble means chaos and confusion, but it's interesting because if you read it, let me turn this fan away just a moment here. There we go. If you read this in the Hebrew, it means to mix or mingle. That's what that word means. To confuse, to mix or mingle. That's what that Hebrew word means. And it's not always a negative term either. Uh, let me give you an example. Leviticus chapter two, verse four, there's many other places it's found, but it says, when you bring a grain offering, it's talking about to the Lord, baked in the oven as an offering, it shall be unleavened loaves of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers smeared with oil. That word mixed is balal or babel. You can look it up. This is in Hebrews, or I'm sorry, in Leviticus chapter two, verse four. That word babel is not necessarily a bad thing when you're talking about mixing ingredients. I want you to think about the ingredients of a cake, right? You got an egg or you've got sugar, you've got flour, you know, all of these different things that go into a cake. Before you mix them all up when they're all separate, right? They are identifiable. They're identifiably distinguishable. You can tell what is the egg. You can tell what is the brown sugar, all of these different things. You can tell them apart, but as soon as you begin to mix them and mingle them, confuse them, you can't tell what is what. It's now become something entirely different, all of its own, right? <laughs> then you don't know exactly what's in the cake. Have you ever eaten something and you went, what in the world is in this? My mom, and she'll be watching this, she knows I make fun of her on these sorts of things. I love my mother. She's, if you ever meet my mother, as many of you have, <laughs> she's in her early 70s and still runs like 100 miles a week. Um, I don't even know if that's an accurate number. It's probably more than that. But she will, is notorious for when they come down to visit, she brings cookies or brownies or some baked good. But there's, never, there's always, she can't leave it alone. She, you know, you're laughing because Ethan knows. You know what I'm saying? They, when she brings the cookies, she's like, I brought you some cookies, but 
I didn't use this kind of sugar. I used this kind of sugar that's healthier and blah, blah, blah. Or I, I didn't use regular flour. I used like some kind of random oat flour that was found in like the Mediterranean desert, something like that. She finds all these kind of random things that she always substitutes in there because they're healthier, right? They got more fiber or something like that. I, eat, I feel like when I eat my mom's baked goods, I actually lose weight, right? <laughs> it's probably not true. I <laughs> mean, but I'll look at my, my stepdad. He's funny because he, he'll tell the truth. She'll tell you, and, and you all have heard people say this, you can't tell the difference. Anybody ever lied about that? Right? You, you're like, we substituted sugar with this random thing, monk fruit or something like that. And they're like, but you can't tell the difference. And so I look at my stepdad, and he's behind her going. <laughs> and I know, okay, all right. Or he'll nod his head and go, it's okay, it's okay. And so then I know I'm going to enjoy that cookie. Um, I love you, Mom. <laughs> Let me read to you out of the dictionary the word confusion as a noun, okay? As a noun, confusion means the lack of understanding or uncertainty, the state of being bewildered or unclear. Confused is also a verb. To confuse something means also to identify wrongly. You think we're seeing that in our culture right now, right? Anybody identifying wrongly in the Olympics, maybe boxing or other sports, right? So that's to confuse means to identify wrongly. It, is, it says that in the original Latin of the word confuse, it means, now listen to this, we just read this out of the Hebrew of the Bible, it means to mingle or mix together. Same thing. And so what's happening in our culture right now is that Opinion, right, is getting mixed and mingled with truth. And then like my mom, who I love dearly, her wonderful cooking and baking, sometimes there's like truth substitutes, right? Sometimes you've got, it's like the truth, but not exactly like the truth, Truth, right? You get those kind of sort of truth, but not entirely the truth. It's a little distorted. It is confused, Right? That's what we see happening in our world today, and the truth and the opinion is no longer identifiably distinguishable like the ingredients that you put into a cake. So I want to show you kind of the first recorded incident of this happening. We're already in Genesis. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, everybody knows the story of the fall of man through Adam and Eve and the serpent. But I, I, I think it's important that we read this so we can see exactly how did confusion enter into our culture, into the world? So in Genesis chapter three, in the garden, everything was perfect. Remember the Lord said, you can eat of all the fruits and the trees of the garden except this one tree in the middle. Do not eat of that fruit and tree. But I wanna show you something. Go to verse one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Did God actually say those exact words? No. God never said anything about touching it. You can climb the tree. You can lean up against the tree. Take a nap under the tree. He never said you can't touch it. He simply said don't eat the fruit of it. So you see how there's already a little bit of confusion happening here. See how Eve has taken the truth, but she's mixed or mingled a little bit of her interpretation of the truth, right? And then the devil takes this opportunity. Look at verse four. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So look at here. The devil takes this opportunity and he does, he speaks truth. Because when they eat the knowledge of the fruit, or the, 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 tr the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, think of what, the what that word is. He says it's the fruit of the tree of truth when he said God knows if you eat this, your eyes are gonna be opened and now you're gonna know good and evil like he does. You ever heard the term ignorance is bliss? 
People want to avoid having to deal with things all the time. Well, we were in a state before Adam and Eve where we were in ignorance and it was blissful. Amen? He didn't lie to her. He gave her the truth, but it was a little bit of a distorted truth mixed in with her misinterpretation of the truth. And now we have the spirit of confusion or the spirit of Babel. And that spirit, we can see it throughout the Bible taking place in different forms and different shapes and different ways. And we can see that spirit operating well in our culture today, amen? We can see the spirit of confusion, the spirit of Babel in operation. Now I wanna show you, just so you have this context, my beautiful, wonderful wife spoke uh, last week with uh, a team from Circle Christian Arts Academy over at Resonate and sharing about the ministry of Circle, and she was able to share a word there based on Daniel. I want you to go to Daniel chapter one with me really quick. Daniel chapter one, and we'll go back to Genesis, so you can hold your finger there too if you'd like, but Daniel chapter one. See, the king Nebuchadnezzar, and if you didn't know, King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of a nation called Babylon, right? Now, it has a Y in it, but they have different spellings for different reasons in that that, that time. But he was king over a nation called Babylon. And I want you to see something. He captures the youth. When they captured Judah, they said, I want you to go get all of the youth. They don't want the old people. He wants the young people that he can influence and indoctrinate, right? He says, we're gonna show them the truth. We're gonna re-educate them with the Chaldean ways. Look at Daniel chapter one, start in verse one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim in, uh, the king of Judah into his hands with some of the vessels of the house of God, And now listen to this. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Now, quickly, go to Genesis 11. Go back to Genesis 11. You can hold your hand in Daniel if you want. We're gonna be back. Genesis 11. Okay, so it says that Nebuchadnezzar, he took the young people from Israel, from Judah, and he was going to re-educate them, but they take them to the land of Shinar. Genesis chapter 11, look at verses 1 and 2. Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. So you can see, this spirit of confusion has a stronghold in this one area. That that's where Babylon is has its kingdom, and that's where they seek to re-educate and confuse by mixing and mingling in with the Hebrew culture, the culture of the Chaldeans and the Babylonians, amen? So go back to Daniel if you're there, and I want you to look at verses three through five with me. Daniel chapter one again, in verses three through five. It says, then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, named, uh, his, the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people from Israel, both the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom. They were already educated, by the way. Do you see this? Endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace. So he said, go get the smart ones. Go get the ones who are already pretty well educated. They're already well off and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them daily portions of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years and at the end of that time they were to stand before the king. If you aren't aware in our culture today, there is a spirit of Babel, a spirit of confusion, a spirit of Babylon that is seeking to get control over the youth. And they want to re-educate them. Notice it said in the literature. Who in the world would think literature is bad? All literature is great, right? But what if that literature is being read by a drag queen in a public library, and it's all about my identity, being read to three, four, five, six-year-olds? Do you see how they're trying to re-educate our children? 
our youth in the culture? This is the spirit of confusion alive and well in our world today. Amen? And I won't go into it just for time's sake, but I would highly encourage you to read on there in chapter one because it describes how they went to rename them and it gave them, they took names that were to uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We all know that, right? Or if it's Veggie Tales, it's uh, Shadrach and Benny, right? And then, but they, they took their Hebrew names, which were glorifying to Yahweh, and they gave them new names that would be glorifying to their pagan gods. They, they wanna seek to confuse their understanding then they want to seek to confuse their identity. And that is the spirit of confusion and babble that is in operation in our world today. And if you didn't know, we are in the last days, right? The prophet Joel describes the day of Pentecost, and he says, in the last days I will pour my spirit out upon all flesh. Jesus described us as being in the last days. This church age that we are in, basically ever since the day of Pentecost, we are in the last days, all right? So it says here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, now the Spirit expressly says that in late, latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4 says, for the time is coming when the people will not endure sound teaching. And having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And who's going to be doing this? Well, Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. He describes men who are false apostles. False. Now, wait a minute. Where do apostles operate? In the church, Right? Deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. You know, Jesus talks about wolves in sheep's clothing, right? And he says they disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. Well, no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. There's a dis deceitfulness that's happening in our nation. You know, they, they call abortion women's health care rights. Never mind that the baby you're murdering might be a woman, right? I mean, women's health care. We talk about, well, what about in the case of incest or rape? I can tell you right now, there was a thing years ago called uh, uh, Rock for Life. When I was in a band, I got to go play for, with this ministry, and they were rock for life. Well, the guy who founded it was a result of rape. And he grew up, had a successful life, married, had children, and had a ministry saving aborted babies. Amen? So I get it. There are extenuating circumstances that are pretty horrible for the poor woman who may have to endure them. But it... Everyone in this room, you've endured or you will endure horrible circumstances that are at the hand of somebody else, some circumstance that was out of your control, and only because in this one situation you have the opportunity to murder another human in order to help you get by with this, right? That doesn't make any sense. If just because something bad happens to you, you could end the life of somebody else to help you cope or get through it. That's not good. That child is still a human and designed by God, amen? But we use deceit and lies. This whole thing about the marijuana bill is, oh, it's good to make it legal because then it gets the, the bad stuff off the streets. Yeah, right. Like a drug dealer who's making a lot of money selling dope on the street, he, all of a sudden, now that it's legal, he's gonna be like, well, I'll go find a legit job now. I'll stop doing that, right? No, I don't think so. It is still going to happen. It is not helping anybody. And there have been studies done. Ms. Lisa posted a thing about it. But if you read it, you'll see that there have been all sorts of bad things happen in areas that have legalized marijuana. But they'll use deceit and make it sound good instead of just telling you the truth of what it is that they're trying to do. We have to watch out, ladies and gentlemen, that there is a spirit of confusion in our world today. Amen? All right, let me read to you Ephesians chapter two. Go there, Ephesians two. I'll take a drink to give you a second. Ephesians 
Ephesians chapter two. Did you know that the world, you can't even be mad at it, really. <laughs> the Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, right? But against principalities and powers and darkness. You can't get mad at the people. The Bible we're gonna read here that says that the world and those who are part of the world, it's their nature. And guess what? It's your nature too, apart from Christ, right? It's our nature. Apart from Christ, we're sinners. Apart from Jesus, we're destined for failure and hell and destruction. So we're not no better than anybody else, okay? Let's read this, Ephesians chapter two. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Remember that, the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So this makes it abundantly clear, doesn't it? That that's our nature before Christ, right? He says, in which you once walked. He says, you were dead, these are past tense, right? You used to have this sin nature. That was before Christ. There was confusion. There was mingling of truth and opinion, right? But now, if you are saved, then the assumption is there's no longer a confusion or a mingling of your spirit with the patterns of this world, Romans 12, 2, it says, do not be conformed to this world, or if you're reading the NIV, the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect, right? So we're not called to continue walking in the sinful ways that we once walked in. We're called to be transported, transformed, renewed. He says, old things have passed away. Behold, you're a new creation now, right? Well, quit living like the old creation. That's confusion, isn't it? When, when you say, I'm a Christian. Yeah, well, you're living like the devil, right? If I'm coming in here, and I'm a Bucks fan, and I tell you I am rooting for the Bucks. Well, then why are you wearing all Seahawks with a finger? And you know what I'm saying? No, no, I love the Bucks. Yeah, but when the Seahawks scored, you jumped up and shouted. I, I'm telling you, I'm a Bucks fan. But you have your car painted in Seahawks colors. I love Tampa Bay Bucks. I'm just, I'm telling you, I love them. Dude, nothing about you looks like you like the bucks. But I'm telling you that I am, so why don't you believe me, right? That's a lot of Christians. I am a Christian. Yeah, well, you cuss like a sailor. But I'm, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. Yeah, but dude, you get drunk every other night. But I, I love Jesus. Dude, nothing about your life says you love Jesus, right? I don't know if you guys are aware of, there's a guy named Phil Robertson, created the duck calls, right? He's the duck commander, I watched a, uh, a video of his testimony. If you ever get a chance, just Google uh, Phil Robertson testimony. It's, it's really cool. It's really, really good. Uh, I'll give you the brief rundown. He's, he said that uh, he had two degrees. He was a football star, an, a, a great athlete, uh, but he got to a point in life where life was not satisfactory to him anymore, and he became uh, a bit of an alcoholic. He was smoking weed. He was running around on his wife and... Uh, his sister, he said, called a, a preacher and said, I want you to go to my brother and tell him about Jesus. And he said, well, where's he at? And she says, you'll find him at such and such bar because he's always there. And so the preacher went to the bar and talked to him about Jesus and he basically cussed him out and told him to get out of here and get lost. He said, but some time went by and he said some things happened and he called that preacher and he ended up giving his life to Jesus, Phil Robertson. And he said, I didn't need anybody to tell me that I should change my ways. 
He said, I knew what repentance meant. He said, I knew I got to put the bottle down. I got to stop smoking dope. He said, I, got, I knew I got to stop cussing like this. I knew I got to quit cheating on my wife. He said, nobody had to tell me. I knew. But then somehow in our culture, you have a bunch of Christians who go, well, is it really that bad? Is, I don't understand. What's wrong with pornography? Is it really that bad? Marijuana. It's natural. But so is hemlock and cyanide. If you want to use that logic, Right? So just in case you're on the fence on some of these things and going, well, God, I'm unsure, I'm unclear, I'm confused. Let me just read you what the Bible says, okay? Proverbs 20, verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. And I just want to clarify, there's another verse. If you come to our Wednesday night Bible study, I teach that we always should interpret Scripture with Scripture. In other words, look at scripture through the lens of other verses that talk about that subject. And there's another verse that says, don't even look at the wine when it begins to sparkle. Don't even look at it, it says. Much less drink it. Well, what is it when wine begins to sparkle? That's the fermentation process that releases alcohol into the liquid. That's the sparkling that you see. So there's one verse that says, don't even look at it when it begins the fermentation process. And then you got another one here that says, don't be led astray by beer and wine and alcohol. It says if you do, you're unwise. The Bible says it. I'm just reading you, these are two verses in the Bible. So you can take it however you want, but I'm just telling you, the Bible says don't even look at it when it begins to ferment. And if you get led astray by it, you're unwise. Ephesians 5.18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And I would apply this to marijuana as well, wouldn't you agree? The Bible tells us to be sober-minded, okay, sober-minded. Ephesians 5, now this is the one that a lot of Christians don't like. I mean, alcohol's bad enough. If you start touching people's booze, man, they get offended on that one. But this one right here, Ephesians 5, 4, let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk or crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Colossians 3, 8 says, put obscene talk away from your mouth. All right, so Christians, if you're cussing, stop it. I mean, is there, I mean, honestly, is there any confusion at this point? Is anybody like, no, I mean, I think God's okay with cussing. He's made it pretty clear, didn't he? But see, we have a culture that will tell you it's really no big deal, and only those religious nuts are the ones that care about that sort of thing. Man, loosen up. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. That's scripture. Put obscene talk away from your mouth. All right. So I'm just giving you, if, if, just in case you're unclear. Are we, is, are, we getting, are we getting the idea here? All right. Proverbs 5. This is for the men especially, but not exclusively. Women, you might want to listen to this one as well. Proverbs 5. Really just read the whole chapter. Because the whole chapter describes drinking water from your own cistern, getting water from your own well. This is a, a euphemism. It's an analogy for men. Love your own wife. Quit loving other women. It says, let the breasts of your wife satisfy you always. Notice it doesn't say let the breasts of the woman on the internet satisfy you. Right? It doesn't say let the breasts of that chick walking by in Walmart satisfy you. It says, let the breasts of your wife satisfy you. It says, do not go into the arms of a forbidden lover. I'll make some jokes in a little bit. You guys will loosen up again. When I start talking about some of this stuff, Christians get all like, oh man, he's reading my mail. No, I don't know you or what you're looking at. I just tell you right now, when people try to confuse and say, it's okay, lighten up a little bit. I have more fun than just about anybody, okay? But I don't need booze, dope, porn. I can have fun without any of that garbage, right? I'm not confused. Amen. So we just finished this, this series. I want you to go to Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Galatians 5. Galatians 5. We just finished the fruit of the Spirit. And I finished by reading these uh, verses. I just want to read them again really quick to all of us. It's uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. I'm in Galatians 3. I should get in the right chapter. 
Galatians 5. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Is this the Lord giving you a laundry list of things that are ultimately fun but he's just stealing from you? Or is this a list of things that God knows will keep you from the ultimate eternal joy that he has in store for all of us, right? And he says, I want you. I have an inheritance for you. But these things are gonna rob you of that inheritance. I have, I have joy unspeakable, the Bible says, waiting for you. But if you try to find joy in these other things and confuse and mingle the ideas of the world and the culture in with my truths that I've told you very clearly, he says, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, I'm protecting you, son and daughter, from the spirit of confusion. This is the same spirit that deceived Eve by questioning, right? Did God actually say, right? That's what he said. He didn't, he didn't even have to lie. All he had to do was put the thought in her mind of, is it really as bad as you think it is? Maybe you misunderstood God. Maybe he's not so uptight. Maybe you can get away with it. And he mingles and mixes and confuses reality. And that's where that spirit of confusion comes in. And that's the space that we find ourselves now in the world where people are divided between the truth of the living God, the word of God, and the culture that they're living in, right? There's a uh, story, we'll, we don't have time to go look at it now, but if you wanna look on your own, it's in 2 Kings chapter 17. It's the story of, of uh, Elijah against the 450 prophets of Baal. And I did a sermon a long time ago about how long will you go limping between two opinions, right? Because it said that the people were worshiping God, but they were serving other gods. You see that? They were worshiping God, but then they were serving other gods. There's that confusion, that dichotomy, that swirling and mingling and mixing. And what we said earlier is that in Romans 12, he says, don't be conformed to that pattern, but he says, you'll be able to discern good from evil, amen? You will be able to discern good from evil. Now go to Hebrews chapter five. Hebrews five, you guys hanging in okay? You doing all right? All right, Hebrews five. Not much longer here, I don't think. Hebrews 5, go to verse 11. Paul's speaking to the people, and he, or writing, I should say. And he's talking to people. He doesn't use the word confuse or mingle or mix, but I think you'll be able to see that that's exactly the, the condition of the people that he's writing to. He says, about this, in verse 11, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For th though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again. The basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Did you see that? To distinguish good from evil. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Well, why is it woe to them? Go to Romans 1. Go to Romans 1. I give a lot of scripture. It's because I don't want you to think this is my opinion. This is the word of God. And when you read it for yourself in the Bible, you can't go, I don't like what he preached. You didn't like the word of God because that's what I preached. <laughs> Romans 1, verses 18 through 20, it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Remember it said, woe to them who call good evil and evil good? He says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. 
Wow. How arrogant do you have to be to suppress the truth? You know it. You can't suppress something you don't know what it is, right? You gotta be able to identify it, see it, get your hands on it to be able to suppress it. So they suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. God doesn't have confusion, amen? God is not the author of confusion. He is the author of peace. He does not bring in confusion. 2 Corinthians 6.14 just says, what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? And then I wanna show you this in 2 Corinthians 11. We're almost done. I'm gonna read it to you out of the New King James Version because of this one word that I think is so beautifully simple but profound. 2 Corinthians 11, verses one through three in the New King James Version says, oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me, for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that's Jesus, that I may present you as a chaste virgin or virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Remember we read that earlier, Genesis 3, right? He deceived her. He says, I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is Christ. Isn't that awesome? Christ is simple. It's the simplicity of Christ. I've often said, you know, you could say getting healthy is simple. I'm not saying it's easy, it's simple. It's not complicated. Eat less calories than you burn. Eat fruits and vegetables, not Doritos. Move your body, don't sit on the couch. I mean, it's not complicated, it's simple. It's just not always easy to do, right? Same thing with walking with Christ. It's very simple. Reject what is bad. Cling to what is good. Let the word of God wash over you. Do what the word of God says. It's simple. It's just not always easy. But you can do it, amen? Deuteronomy 30, I, I have so many scriptures, I'm not gonna get to all of them, but Deuteronomy 30, he talks about this and he says, this is easy. He says, it's not in heaven that you can't reach it. It's not in the depths of the sea that you can't get to it. He says, it's here and you can do it. The commandments of God are available. They are simple for you. 1 Corinthians 13, or 14, 33 says, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Isaiah 9, 6 says that Jesus is the prince of peace. Remember we read earlier in Ephesians, it says that the devil is the prince of the power of the air. Okay, so he has a little bit of reign and rule that God allows him to have for a season, right? But it says that Jesus is the prince of peace. 2 Thessalonians 3, 16 says, now may the Lord of peace give himself peace or himself give you peace at all times in every way the Lord be with you. Now go to James 3, we are coming in. I hope and pray that you are encouraged to seek the Lord in a deeper way than you ever have in your life because he is the arbiter of truth, he is truth. Jesus says I'm the way, the truth, and the life, amen? James chapter three. James chapter three, we're gonna read 15 through 18. James 3, 15 through 18, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, it's unspiritual, it's demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder. And that word disorder is also confusion in the Greek. Confusion. And every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure and peaceable gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So you have the option 
of the spirit of chaos, the spirit of Babel, or the prince of peace, the spirit of Christ, the simplicity of Christ. Isaiah 26.3 says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. And that word peace, if you didn't already know this, it is shalom, right? Anybody ever heard somebody say shalom? Did you know that that word shalom in the original Hebrew, it doesn't, it doesn't say the word peace. What it is saying is wholeness, singularness. It's completeness. It's not divided. It's not mixed or mingled. It is completely whole. When someone says to you, shalom, what they're saying is, I hope that you will have wholeness. You will be complete. You won't be divided mind, mixed, your hearts mingled with other things, that you will have peace. Amen? And Colossians 3, 15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. The band can come up. There's reasons why people don't have the peace that is offered and available to them through Christ. And what we are seeing in the word of God is that when we mix and mingle and confuse with the ideology of the culture or of the world around us, with the truth that we know is ultimately of God, it's actually exhausting torture, isn't it? If you've ever done it, if you've, I have done it in my life, it is exhausting trying to play both sides of the fence. It is. It is, it's, it's, it'll just wear you out because in your mind you've always got tension of I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I can't help it. I feel like it's just drawing me to it. And is it really that bad? Is it really that bad? I'm better off than that guy, right? When we mix and mingle with the culture of the world around us, we inevitably can't truly have the peace that he promises us when our mind is stayed on him or fixed on him. When your mind is fixed on him, he says you will have peace. So I've got two more things I wanna read to you really quick. This, just because you hear keyboards playing doesn't mean put your Bible away. Two more scripture I wanna read. During the time of the judges, this is repeated multiple times throughout the book of the judges, but I wanna read to you just one of those verses. And it says this in Judges 17, 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Okay, we're going to bring this in here. See, having a king means submission, doesn't it? You have to submit to the authority of the king because what the king says goes. That ain't no democracy. That's no republic. It's a monarchy. King wants it. He's going to get it. King doesn't want it, you better not provide it. King tells you to do something, you do what the king says, right? And it says there was a, a time in Israel when there were no kings, and it says everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Could you imagine the confusion and chaos of everybody doing what's right in their own eyes? You ever hear people say, well, you do you. Your truth is your truth. That ceases to be truth at that point, by the way. The moment you have a truth and I have a truth, guess what? It's not truth, it's now opinion, okay? Because truth is truth. If I wanted to jump off of this stage, but I say, it's my opinion, I don't believe that gravity exists. Am I gonna float because I don't think it? No, I'm gonna slap on the ground because truth is truth, you can't change truth. Truth is truth. But it says that there was a time when because there was no king, Everyone just did whatever they wanted all over the place. And it was just chaos and pandemonium. But I want us to align ourselves under King Jesus today and submit to his rule and his authority. So last scripture, go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Because there is a king, whether you acknowledge him or not, right? Right? doesn't change his lordship there's a king there's one king and it's Jesus he's sitting on his throne right now amen he is reigning he is ruling 
So I want to read this to you. As the way, you know, let's do what they do in like Catholic churches and stuff. Can you stand up while we read? We're going to read this standing. Praise the King. Amen. Listen to this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Jesus Christ, or of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. This is, this is the charge to you. You ready? Verse 14. To keep the commandment un stained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time he who is the blessed and the only sovereign there is no other is one amen there's one king he's the only sovereign the king of kings and the lord of lords amen that there is one king, one truth, there's one way. And we can so easily confuse and muddy the water by mingling and mixing in other ideologies and thoughts and opinions. But there's one word of God. There's one king of kings. There's one Lord of lords. And the way that we find peace is to have our mind fixed on him. No other distractions, amen? No other distractions. Do everything unto the glory of God. The way we interact with people, the way we drive our cars, and Lord, I forgive me for, I don't drive my car well on I-75 in rush hour. But we are to do everything unto the glory of God, amen? All right, you can put your Bibles away now. <laughs> Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna worship the King. The song is called Praise the King. And as he provides joy unspeakable, amen? He provides the hope. He provides the assurance. He provides the comfort, the joy, the peace. So let's honor the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Can we do that right now? Let's honor him today before we go out of here, go get lunch, or do anything.